Welcome everyone. Nice to see folks logging in. Appreciate that. Get started here in a quick minute. Just got to give everyone a chance to kind of get their Zoom opened up. Good. Nice. People are still logging in here. Okay, good. Well, hello everyone. This is The Net Effect and uh, episode 19 of the Career Conversations and Connections. Thank you all for taking time out of your day to join us for this wonderful biblically-based webinar series. I'm your host, Robin Jones, director of the ABF Career Alliance. And we have a special treat for you today. Um, before we get started, I'm going to do a little housekeeping. Uh, if you would be so kind, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little icon that says Q and A. If you all would open that, click it, and then type in your name and where you're from just to make sure it's working. I would really appreciate that. This is how we will communicate today. And it's open for everyone to see. Um, good. Hey, Kristen. Sorry, we had uh, we had to evacuate this week, and unfortunately, that took a little bit of a little bit of our time and efforts. But we're back home. Nice to see you, Conrad. Good, Wendy. Wonderful. So, um, if you're having challenges with Zoom, make sure that you've downloaded the application so that you can participate in our Q&A today. And I highly recommend that if you do have a question, type it in the Q&A and we'll, we will do our best to get to that as we move along. We do have a wrap-up Q&A at the end as well. So we'd love, um, love to hear from you all. Um, and, and we're not going to be using chat. So uh, I, I'm not going to be engaging with chat, so just make sure that you know that. If you have any questions or comments, just put them in the Q&A so everybody can see them there. So, looks like everything's rolling. If you have any, um, if you have any questions about things, please be sure and put that in there, and I'll do my best to get to that uh, if you're struggling with something. Today, we have the privilege of welcoming a diplomat and executive with over 30 years of experience in international relations, global issues, and development financing. Ursula has worked in almost 50 countries around the world. Most recently, she served as Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Director of the Board of the World Bank Group. In a time when most everyone is questioning how to engage and build trust with multiple stakeholders and complex issues to find harmonious solutions. We have the privilege of learning from someone who has done it all over the globe in some of the most challenging circumstances. So without further ado, welcome Madam Secretary General. Very happy to be with you all. So we would love to learn about your journey and how you embarked on this incredible um, career that has taken you so many places and ha you have done so many wonderful and marvelous things. So help us kind of get up to speed on how you kind of got where you are. Actually, I wanted to be an inventor. Ah. I liked uh, creative thinking and finding solutions. I was fascinated uh, by the by human inventions from the light bulb to how to make planes fly. But then I thought, well, how can I deploy my 
skills and based on the values I believe in. Um, I was interested in global issues, in um, international relations, and I thought, I want to be a diplomat. Good. Uh, how do you become a diplomat? Well, I studied economics and I also have a master's degree in public administration. And then I just applied for the foreign service of my country, which is Germany. Of course, there's a competitive uh, process um, and I got in. And um, this was a wonderful opportunity to really contribute to humanity and to promote good as a Christian scientist. Um, we demonstrate um, in our lives intelligence and wisdom, good thinking, good speaking, good acting. And I thought as a diplomat, you prevent conflicts, you negotiate peace, you address global challenges in a cooperative way. And in these days, it's more needed than ever to address global challenges uh, together. Um, they are just too enormous um, given uh, the uh, the if impact of climate change that leads to droughts in many countries where people have to move because they cannot live off their land. Um, so addressing global challenges and building trust uh, is uh, something as a, a diplomat does. And I uh, had the great opportunity to work in many countries, as you mentioned. And when I was at the board of the World Bank, which is the World Bank is a uh, development finance institution. So to to improve people's lives, um, you need also a lot of money, but you also need to have the right uh, programs in uh, governance, in uh, renewable energy, um, to, to really have a sustainable development. In my last position, the last three years as um, Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs of the United Nations, I was coordinating um, the international response to um, the human needs. There's more than 130 million people on our globe that are in urgent need of some kind of humanitarian assistance because they um, were either displaced, there was flooding, there was conflict, there's 70 million people on our globe being forcibly displaced. So to provide water, food, shelter, to really meet human needs and also fundraise um, for, for, uh, for being able to provide um, the goods and services. Well, I wonder um, in, these, in these wonderful positions that you, you, you found yourself in and um, in this career journey, how, how important has church been in that, in that journey? I've always found inspiration, support, healing by going to church. Um, maybe I just share one example uh, with you, which is a profound um, proof that we are all blessed by going to church and attending church services and also being part of the church family. Um, I once I was in my diplomatic career posted from my home country to Washington DC, to the German embassy in Washington DC. And uh, wherever I worked, I worked in all continents, from Australia to, to um, the United States. Um, so wherever I worked, I wanted to be a member of a Christian Science local branch church. So as soon as I had arrived in Washington, D.C., I looked around and attended a church, and I applied for membership. But after four months of my tenure, usually a tenure is three, four years, I was deployed to Afghanistan by my foreign minister. That was immediately after the terror attacks of 9-11. And I thought, I was really in fear to be deployed to a country that we all knew there was Taliban, there was 23 years of civil war. And a week before I went to Afghanistan, I was admitted as a member of that dear branch church. And one Sunday, the members welcomed me after the service. I did not know many people there, but it meant so much to me to be part of the family. The Wednesday before I left for Afghanistan, the readings were on protection. And one quote from, I think it's in Proverbs, says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and the Lord 
shield is your shield if you trust in him. And when I was in Afghanistan, one night we received from the intelligence service information that there was an imminent bomb threat and an imminent bomb attack against the German embassy and we all lived on this compound. And I prayed so hard exactly with this concept, God being our shield and God being my rock, my fortress, my shield. And if he's all present and all power, there can nothing come near us or destroy anything. And I was suddenly so calm and my, all, um, my colleagues felt this influence. Fear can't paralyze you. Mm. And there was no bomb attack that night. There was no bomb attack any time after. And this just proves to me what an, a privilege it is to have church. And I was also supported by this um, church, by the members of the church. I remember the first reader sent me an email at the time um, and it was sort of almost a, a spiritual lifeline. And I'm so grateful for, for being a Christian scientist and being able to uh, to have uh, services, church services, and going to church, whether they are in a church building or whether right now they are online. It's pretty remarkable, isn't it? I mean, you're brand new in town, and and you're just getting rolling with the church, you know, a local church, and then you get shipped off, and and yet you still feel that sense of love and support, you know, halfway around the globe, you know, with people that you've hardly known or are hardly met, and yet there's a, still there's that sense of fellowship that that. Um, it brings forward that healing. That's just that's such a remarkable, um, remarkable story. Um, so what issues um, and important issues have you been thinking about and addressing in your work? And, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll start down a journey here to kind of look at some different places and things that you've, you've, you've worked in. But I thought these were really wonderful ideas to share with um, our audience. You know, given the enormity of um, human needs, humankind is longing for healing. You might feel overwhelmed or even frustrated being an individual or a group of people to try to provide assistance. Huh? So, what really helped me is to know that divine love meets every human need. And that God is the sustaining infinite, as Ms. Zadie said. I always wondered why doesn't she say God is the infinite, the all? No, she says in our textbook, um, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, God is the sustaining infinite. That was a new revelation to me. Actually, I was sitting in a church in New York after I took this job at, with the United Nations, they have their headquarters in New York, and I was working out from there. One evening I saw on the wall, the sustaining infinite. I never realized this before. So this helped me a lot uh, in my work to know it's just put aside personal responsibility, trust in divine love meeting every human need. And, um, Ms. Zeddy is such a wonderful role model and, uh, um, and I sometimes seek guidance uh, in, in the Bible and in our textbook when she says, soul has infinite resources with which to bless mankind. So of course there's human needs, but what is also important to see the dignity of the people and they need a lot more than just physical food or water. So when I met, I met hundreds of thousands of people traveling in the last three years to 45 countries, last three years alone, most wow. in Africa, but also in Asia, in Latin America. Um, and when I was sitting with people and uh, looked in their eyes, uh, I really saw the dignity and God's love for each of his children. And God has not created a chaotic world. He maintains and preserves his creation. But we have a responsibility to not just lean back, but to really uh, practice um, uh, and apply uh, the divine laws of, um, of uh, mind also. I always turn, I very often turn to the one mind guiding me to find a solution for 
a challenge. Well, obviously, um, that is a that is a concept that's dearly needed. I mean, even in our our own communities, we see the need for that just with conversations, with being able to uh, face the challenges that are are as so many of our cities in the United States are facing. Um, Let's talk a little bit about how um, divine love, how you saw that in these two examples of meeting those needs. Yes, um, for instance, um, last year there was tremendous floods uh, that affected three countries in East Africa, Malawi, Zimbabwe, um, and Madagascar. And um, so, these conflicts or, or natural disasters don't stop at a border. So first of all, those countries needed to cooperate and then the international community also needed to support their efforts given the enormity of um, the damage caused and the, the people uh, made homeless. Um, so um, to assess needs um, and to coordinate effective response needs um, listening. And it's also listening to the local people. And that's what I, I really have learned to respect each individual and to also see their willingness to address um, issues, even in conflict situations. How do you overcome some of the distractions that try to creep up when you're working in a place like that? I mean, I. We're out here in California, and uh, uh, there's, there was a fire here locally, and um, we had to evacuate. And so it, it's pretty frantic, because last year, we had a fire north of us in a little town called Paradise, and within a matter of minutes, it was gone and in flames. So, and then all, so you, get all, you get all these different you know, things that are happening. How do, you, how do you work through those distractions when you're trying to help people? For instance, what you see on the screen right now, um, the little girl there, she is a refugee. And there's a lot of human trafficking going on. Mm. So knowing that there is evil <laughs> um, out there that causes human suffering, you should, just makes me know I cannot stand aghast at nothingness. I need to see the preciousness of this child, for instance, and parents. And I met a lot of women um, who told me about their plight. So listening to them with compassion, but also with humility, and listening to them how they see what they really need, because sometimes, um, we want to do good, but it's not really the right thing to do. So the international community, which is a lot of uh, non-governmental organizations, a lot of United Nations organizations like UNICEF, the World uh, Children's Organization or the Refugee Organization. So they all um, are, have uh, their mandates um, and want to do something, but to coordinate it in a, in a way that it has an impact and it really meets the needs of the people. So that's why you um, I had the privilege to really being with them and listening to them. And you see, they, they are looking forward, not backwards. And um, praying and working with right motives. Our Father, Mother, God will open the way. Well, how do you approach communication and, and the, uh, the topic of leadership um, when, you're, when you're out there in so many diverse countries with so many different type of people and um, social backgrounds and religious affiliations. Tell us a little about that. Well, um, your question is, uh, who is my role model as a leader? Actually, I have two. One is Christ Jesus. Ah. Look at how he went out to meet the people. 
how he healed them, whatever their need was, whatever their status was, or their race, or their religious affiliation. So he never gave up. That's another uh, quality of leadership, which Jesus Christ demonstrated. He didn't say, that's too hard for me. <laughs> so he never gave up. And he also knew where his strength comes from. He, he uh, trusted in God. And um, so I'm also listening for, for inspiration and guidance um, um, from, from our only source um, that gives us spiritual power and protection. I was in conflict situations um, talking to, to armed uh, guys. <laughs> um, and um, I never wore a bulletproof jacket. Uh, you see me wow. on these pictures with a normal United Nations blue vest. Um, um, so uh, Jesus Christ is um, one of my role models. And the other, of course, an, a remarkable individual, Mary Baker Eddy. She is just amazing. She was a discoverer, a founder of a global church. I once was also a member of a um, Christian Science Church in Sydney, Australia. Ah. So I've been a member of seven different Christian Science branch churches because my work <laughs> um, made me stay several years in different places. So Mary Baker Eddy, she is a global leader. In 1908, she founded the Christian Science Monitor. At the time, she did not even have the right to vote in her own country, the United States. That's incredible. She founded the Christian Science Monitor with a motto, to injure no man, but to bless all mankind. Mm -hmm. And for our mm -hmm. audience, I really strongly recommend to read the Christian Science Monitor, to get a global perspective. What I learned in my different jobs is to really also get into the perspective of other people and to broaden really your, your um, mindset. So Mrs. Eddy is just um, uh, um, a, an outstanding individual and leader. And she's my role model. And you feel that her ideas and the inspiration that you've learned from studying the Bible and science and health has been practical and demonstrable and is still current. Absolutely. Is that, oh, good. I, <laughs> I, it's so nice to hear that and see that. And for instance, another thing what I admire um, in a leader and these two leaders particularly, how do you take decisions? Hmm. We have to take decisions in our private lives. How do you take a decision? And Mrs. Eddy made many decisions. Sometimes the people who worked for her were not in agreement with her decisions. So she always went to God and the one mind leading her. So we need to have to make time and also go into our closet to be still and listen to what God tells us. Sometimes we may not like it or don't understand it. Listen and follow the leadings of truth. That was my um, guidance also. Well, tell us about these two pictures and how uh, <laughs> your role models influenced your <laughs> thinking and helped these folks. Well, as you see, to a human standpoint, these people live in dire situations and circumstances. But look at the happiness on their faces. Well, I was just going to say, it, it, from you heart sure, to heart, just meeting each other. Yeah, you just you sure couldn't tell it by um, their faces, right? Yeah. Sometimes I did not speak the languages, um, although I speak many languages, um, which is also um, builds confidence and trust. Um, so whoever wants to have an international career, um, <laughs> it's advisable to speak other languages than English. So. But you see communication, as Mary Baker already says in the uh, Science and Health, is from God to his idea man. 
So that you see there's engagement, there is communication and love communicates mm. across color of face or um, languages or different life experiences. So here I'm listening also to, to the people um, uh, I'm sitting with. Mm. And you know, my motto also is um, serving humanity with humility. I like it. And not going, talking to people from above, just going down, sit in the dirt with them. And another um, example I want to share with, um, with you is why it is so important to be humble. Mm. Uh, my role models were both very humble. And humble uh, to be, uh, humility is not a weakness. When I interviewed for the position as Assistant Secretary General with the United Nations, the Secretary General interviewed me and he asked me, what was the greatest thing you achieved in your professional career so far? I could have mentioned great things I did, but what I mentioned is that, you know, when I served in Afghanistan and I was listening to the people and seeing the resilience and the dignity and how they are adapting after a civil war and see what needs to be helped up by the international community and just instead of just coming and offering something that might not be appropriate. And the next day I got a call and I was offered this position. It was exactly this um, attitude or approach huh, to um, not come as a white face or an international um, <laughs> official to, um, to tell those people what is the solution or impose something on them. So humility um, or serving humanity with humility is um, a great privilege. Well, what about this fine looking gentleman here and your engagement with him regarding leadership and communication? You see, I met very diverse people. <laughs> right. Uh, um, this one is in Niger, in Africa. So we could speak French. Um, and a fine prime minister of that country. And the threats they face is from terrorist groups outside. It's a relatively stable country, but the terrorist groups like Boko Haram mm. from outside are infiltrating their country. So um, we uh, had uh, amazing discussions how uh, the leadership of this country is going to address it, how to, how to provide um, um, livelihoods for these people and to protect them and how the United Nations with a various uh, tool, with a whole toolbox can support them in their efforts. When you were um, having those kinds of discussions about terrorism, how do you how do you think about the people that are inflicting the pain and the suffering? I mean, how do you work through some of those challenges from um, you know trying to find a trying to find a way to meet that challenge and see that individual as uh, as a way uh, to find a solution there? Well. The um, countries that are um, impacted uh, by um, terrorists, for, terrorist attacks from outside um, um, are in the driver's seat, first of all. Um, and there, the international community can, um, can support their efforts. In this case, there is no United Nations peacekeeping troop. I mean, there's 18 countries where the United Nations has peacekeepers that are composed of soldiers or policemen from various countries huh, that contribute to those uh, peacekeepers. Um, in this country, uh, the challenge was to prevent the country from um, collapsing, <laughs> um, being faced with these uh, uh, external threats. So the people um, are key to um, uh, address their needs on behalf of the government, because uh, if the government does not take care of their people um, with uh, meeting their needs, um, having 
um, enough food, for instance, in this case, it's a very poor country. Um, they are prone to also being um, uh, falling prey to, to terrorists um, who promise them give you, give you a gun and thus you have, have self-esteem, particularly the young, the young guys. And I, I hear some of the things that you're saying and I, it resonates with some of the things that's happening in our cities, you know, in the United States with young folks getting a gun, you know, and being, having that presence. I wonder, metaphysically, how, how do you think about that? How do you, how did you address that in your thought and or maybe share with, with us some ideas about how maybe we can think about it and embrace these folks in our community in a, in a way that brings about healing. I think these people who resort to violence, um, have a lack of self-esteem and of purpose of true purpose in life. Every one of God's children has a unique purpose. And um, when we pray that each of God's children is, has skills which can be deployed in a useful way, um, it's a big, big um, contribution we can make. I like it. I like it. Well, here you are again in the middle <laughs> of a group of folks, and I can see that you're listening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell us about this place. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, It just shows that um, there's also leadership wherever you go. The local people um, explained to me the situation um, and um, I was just thinking about um, various options and um, Here I was, uh, in this situation, I was asking, is my heart ready to listen to, to God's all power and all presence? When I hear, oh, look, this, there's still these, um, this violence is still going on. Um, I don't know whether people can be relocated here or there. And um, I always think there must be a, um, a um, harmonious solution that comes out from listening to the people. So the local leadership, which you see here, um, is and where key, are we here? Key. Here. Uh -huh. What country is this? <laughs> I guess that was in. Um, Obviously, Africa. Central African Republic. Got it. In the uh, middle of Africa, yeah. And here you are in this colorful group. Um, and it looks like mostly women. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. Um, and whenever you sit with women, there's one issue that comes up, which is gender-based violence. This is not a challenge that's that only African societies are faced with. This is pertinent in every society. And this absolutely needs to be addressed. For instance, when I listen to a group of 80 women, each one of them, different ages from 14 to older, told me that they had an experience of sexual violence and they, know the perpetrators, which are not held to account. So listening to them, and then later on having the opportunity to talk to the president and the prime minister of that country, which I'm not going to mention, 
I thought of how am I going to communicate with the leadership? Because I really felt this is something that's dear to my heart, gender equality in general, but sexual violence against women cannot be tolerated in any society. So when I had my meeting with the president and the prime minister, I was really turning to God how to take this topic to those men. And God provided the answer. I started saying, no society can heal if this is not addressed. And perpetrators are not held accountable and there is no focus on prevention. And it was just wonderful to see that they are aware of this problem and they want to do something about it. So this was um, an guidance by, by listening to God, how to take communication by listening to the people and um, trying to change that situation, particularly to prevention going forward. But I said, no society can heal this is not addressed. And you have to engage men. I also talk to men about this in the villages uh, or in the communities, because they must have an interest that their daughters are not being raped. Well, you would think, because I mean, they, they have daughters as well, right? And how, how did that conversation go when you had those conversations? Yeah, for instance, I had the um, opportunity to meet one of the prefets, which is sort of a, like a governor. <laughs> Uh, responsible for a big area. And um, I said, well, you have a prison over there. Do you also have um, judges to, um, <laughs> to try uh, those people? No. So this is where, for instance, the United Nations and the international community can also help set it up and um, um, do, do training in human rights and in, in other um, um, procedural issues um, regarding uh, legal issues. Did you find that you made some progress, that, that there was receptivity and yes, yeah. those ideas were yeah. welcomed? You know, you cannot stop good from unfolding. I strongly saw evidence of that. But it's just very important to listen what approach to take. Hmm. And here you are again, another yeah. beautiful, smiling, intensely listening group of folks. Mm -hmm. And you know, you'd never forget these people. Having met really hundreds um, <laughs> in my job, jobs, I, I have them in my heart <laughs> because when I look in their eyes, uh, this is something um, so precious and valuable. And this all actually also gives me the energy because this is a tough job <laughs> going out there um, in um, hot climate and uh, <laughs> dusty and sometimes also very dangerous. Huh? So being with these people and trying to, to understand you know, and um, from their point of view and uh, just listen and find solutions. I love it. Well, um, your, your top... Um, and one of the things we wanted to talk about and kind of transitioning uh, is the, the, the job opportunities that, that might be out there and how you might find and prepare for an interview. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, to our audience also, I think if you're looking for a job, you have to make it known. Hmm. Talk about your talents. Um, your values. Be aware yourself of, of the values you stand for and the skills you, you have or you still want to, to develop. I'm a life learner. Um, <laughs> um, so I encourage you to, to really um, develop your, your skill set and um, learn a new language or um, uh, read about um, uh, world history uh, or a biography of someone you think is interesting um, and um, just make make it known um, and um, create um, uh, also um, 
or connect with people, connect with people that share your values. Um, and you can, all, you can learn from everybody. When you do, you may find yourself um, <laughs> with this guy, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. This is the Secretary General of the United Nations, yeah. Yeah, how fun. Yeah. So um, as, as you think about looking for a job and, and as, you, as you just said, you know, talking about yourself and being really unafraid to do so, um, how important is it to find or have conversations with different types of people that, you know, that may not be in your field of interest, so to speak? Mostly that's more successful to meet and connect with people that are not in your field. Um, so for, uh, you can grow and learn. And my advice is to also grab every opportunity um, to meet people that inspire you. Um, for instance, I'm a member of a running club in New York. And uh, one day a former marathon runner um, visited from Kenya and joined our running group um, uh, in Central Park. And I was running with her. Her name is Tekla Laloup. She told me she is a winner of the marathon in Berlin, a winner of the Boston Marathon, a winner of the New York Marathon. And I was running with her. Oh, wow. And she told me about her work now. She is um, running or she's the CEO of an NGO, a non-governmental organization in Nairobi, um, focusing on the education of, of uh, children. So. We discover we have a joint mission <laughs> to 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 do good uh, for humanity, and we are still connected. So you never know um, uh, who you meet. Um, uh, so just be open to um, to learn about new cultures also, um, and um, grab every opportunity to to connect with in person. Or these days we have. Um, all sorts of other um, opportunities to connect. I love your ideas about how to deal with uncertainty and negativity. Tell us wow. a little bit about that. I, I'm sure you faced that a few times, right? Absolutely. But you know what's interesting? I was reading the Christian Science Monitor yesterday, and they have a whole series on navigating uncertainty. Oh, I love but it. But this was a different scale. Here we are talking about ourselves. And I feel sometimes we are so focused on ourselves and our problems that we forget about navigating uncertainty on the globe and given geopolitics today. So I certainly recommend it's a fantastic series. But um, how do I deal with um, uncertainty? You have to have a mindset and a skill set to, um, that helps you address what you are faced with. Um, so focusing or the discipline, actually when growing up as a Christian scientist and we all study the daily, the, we study daily our Bible lesson. So discipline. And I always find answers in the, in the lesson. So discipline helps deal with a lot of things. So having goals is also very important. Um, um, and focusing on achieving goals. Um, so for instance, <laughs> um, again, an example of just what I did in summer, um, since I couldn't go anywhere, um, I in, uh, registered for a virtual run, but you ah. actually had to do the running. Uh, it was a distance of um, between Washington DC via New York City to Boston, which is 457 miles. Oh. I did it in 40 days uh -huh. and this was so much fun. So every day out running about 11 miles. Um, and so that was a goal and um, do something and also enjoy what you're doing. Sometimes you have to have also fun <laughs> um, and uh, or learning a language. I started learning Spanish. It's one of the languages I don't know yet. Um, um, and I think it's a, it's wonderful. So since, um, six months I'm studying, um, uh, Spanish and I learned so much. I'm listening to news in slow Spanish Latina. I learned so much about this, um, Latin America. Oh, so there's just some ideas uh, how, um, apart from praying daily for yourself, um, um is helping you, um, stay optimistic. Ah. 
So your top three takeaways as we um, move to our closing. Yeah, focus actively on what you can bring to your community, to, to the world. So just go get away from your own self also. Just focus what you can bring um, and start with your own family, for instance. Huh? Mm -hmm. um, my second takeaway would be listen, respect, and learn from other people. I like that. And follow the leadings of divine mind with an honest heart. And you have, then you have confidence and, and you trust in God, given um, um, that he gave you a purpose. I like and, it. Um, listen where you are led to. And finally, all we do is to the glory of God. I think that looks like that's served you well. Had some really fun times and interesting places by practicing that, it looks like, right? Right. So if I want to become or I want to have a career as a diplomat or work in the Foreign Service, um, here are some of the things that you suggest um, thinking about studying. Uh, any ideas or comments about that? Well, if you want to study history, that's also fine. Um, but if you want to address uh, global challenges and negotiate, you also have to develop some personal skills. Uh, there's, of course, there's techniques how to negotiate, uh, how to build consensus. Um, um, and my favorite um, uh, resource um, is the Christian Science Monitor. I think these guys are doing amazing work. How to, we, how can we think about global um, issues and learning about different um, um, experiences? I like their stories um, and I just listened also to um, the webinar they put on, on the Middle East, their correspondent in the Middle East. Just outstanding. And uh, if you want to join uh, the United Nations eight organizations, there's many of those. Um, you can go on the website, you can work for United Nations Children's Fund, World Food Program, um, United Nations Refugee Agency, um, or this big building, which is the so-called Secretariat in New York. Um, but once the organization um, I was uh, leading is, has 2,000 staff, um, uh, within the UN, but also field offices. So you can, um, whatever you, um, I, you think you should have finished some sort of a degree um, and work on your, your skill sets. It's remarkable to me when I was talking, we were talking earlier about all the different um, career pathways that are available. So, I mean, if, if you have an interest in something, there's probably a way that you can find a job in that or pursue that pathway um, through you know, a, a world organization, like you said, an NGO or a State Department or many of the other uh, organizations that are out there. So it's, it's just incredible to hear you talk about all the different opportunities there are. So you know, if you do have that interest, then I, I think there's certainly a way to, to open that up. But we have to figure out a way to, to get to our final Q&A and start to wrap things up. Now, uh, if there, anyone has any questions, be sure that you post it in the Q&A. But Conrad had a question that I wanted to ask you. And he says, in what ways have you found success in praying to remove responsibility and trust that God is doing the work? Well, I, I go back to my role models um, who had a lot of responsibility, much bigger than any of us has. So Jesus knew that it is 
for his father providing for those 4,000 or 5,000 he had to feed. Yeah. <laughs> um, that it's, if we really entirely trust in God's all power, all presence, we are led to a job, the job might find you, <laughs> um, and um, responsibility, personal responsibility, of course we have, if you are in a senior position, you have a lot of responsibility for your staff, huh? um, you have to be accountable, um, but knowing that God takes us by, or we, we, we should hold on to his hand and he leads us. Or uh, knowing that divine love leads, inspires, designates the way, if you're looking for a job, divine love lead, uh, in, inspires, designates, and leads the way, as Ms. Zeddy says. I've had so many proofs of that being true. Carol asks, what are positive trends you are observing in the world and what are more disconcerting trends that especially need our prayer? What I really think is fantastic that the young generation is active to take action against um, the exploitation of the planet, to take care of our planet regarding all the climate action. So our style of living has, um, is not sustainable. Um, polluting uh, the air, um, exploiting resources. So I'm very encouraged to see that young generations, uh, the young generation is um, taking responsibility and action and also not only writing to leaders. I just read that they are, uh, for instance, um, as everyone knows, Greta Thunberg and other young people, uh, the Friday for Futures, they just met with the German chancellor and also the French uh, president. So to really um, tell them you have responsibility and this is very urgent. So this is encouraging. And each one of us can also do something about how we live and how we care um, for our uh, environment. And what's, well, con what's concerning, um, Carol asked also what um, we need to pray about. God respects his creation and each individual. And we also should respect each individual. Another question, kind of similar to some of the ones we've just talked about, but when there seems to be so many reasons to not trust a person or not trust a group, how do you find your way through that so that you can um, overcome that, you know, those, that adversity of looking at people and going, eh, I don't know if I can believe what that person said, mm -hmm. right? Thank you very much for this question. It's very important because I mean, behind us is the word corruption also, yeah? <laughs> and uh, we have to expose evil and destroy it and name and address it. And this is very important. And um, not let, let <laughs> it get away with it. So uh, that's uh, some, where a lot of money is involved. Um, that's very, not only money, but also trust, building trust. Um, it's a lot e easier to destroy trust than to build a <laughs> trust. Uh, and a diplomat over years builds trust between people, between nations, between countries. Um, and uh, if uh, you feel you're lied at, uh, something's terribly wrong, this has to be um, addressed and exposed in a way that um, affects a change of behavior. Thank you. Um, Sydney asked, the word intelligence has several meanings in the diplomatic and geopolitical <laughs> environment, right? Yeah. Um, how do you apply intelligence, omniscience, insight, knowledge as concepts within your work? 
Well, I use the word intelligence also in the two meanings. Uh, I said, as a Christian scientist, we demonstrate in our lives intelligence and love uh, uh, by good thinking and speaking and acting. And I also mentioned the intelligence service uh, that um, gave us warning of the imminent uh, terror uh, um, bomb th attack right. um, in mm -hmm. Afghanistan. So um, uh, this, this is what the, uh, the, the question alluded to. Um, well, intelligence um, meaning um, to, f to collect information um, and um, uh, and base or, and analyze it. Uh, um, it's it's very important, but it's not what diplomats do. They are not in the intelligence uh, business, <laughs> um, like um, in, uh, intelligence services. But uh, it's very important to know of, of threats against um, a country, against um, embassies. Um, so I, I rely on divine intelligence, which that example which I shared really proved. Um, <laughs> All right. Dennis asks, apart from looking up to Jesus Christ, would you encourage having human role models? That's a very good question. That brings me also to talking a bit about mentors. Um, I think it's very important to also have mentors. Um, um, I, had, I was mentored by others and I was a mentor for others. Um, so someone to also share um, um, how to deal with certain challenges in your, your, your job, your career. Um, I had... Um, ambassadors, I would consider my role model who, who were leading and communicating in a way that was really, um, I thought, well, I would like to, to be like this. Um, but I also had other bosses <laughs> where I thought, well, this is totally the way I don't want to, to lead people. Um, so I think it's um, good to have um, human role models, um, after all, um, Mary Baker Eddy was uh, an outstanding individual <laughs> trotting on this globe, so was uh, Jesus Christ. But um, I think it's very important to have um, role models. And I also encourage um, our listeners to reach out to, um, uh, to people you think you can learn from. <laughs> um, I can share with you, someone called me up and said, well, uh, can, I have a, um, can I meet you in the, in the coffee shop? I would like to chat with you. Wow, I thought this is very courageous, and I encourage you to do to do that. Huh? Pick your mentor, or <laughs> reach out to someone you you think um, can offer you something and can guide you, and um, or even only listen to you. Or a team of mentors, you know, have have a group of people that you talk with. Um, question about racism, and and knowing that it's important that all racism is acknowledged as evil. How do you address race? How have you addressed racism in the places that you've been, whether it's in a church or schools or, um, you know, working in the different communities that we saw earlier? How do you destroy this type of animal magnetism? Particularly in the United States, that's um, an issue given also the history. Sometimes it really helps to educate ourselves about the history. Uh, um, what are the um, systemic um, um, causes um, that need to be dismantled? When I was in Africa and you saw, I did not realize I was white. I was really colorblind. I did not see these people as black. I saw them as precious individuals with their own individuality. And that's what we um, have learned in Christian science. And we have to do a lot of work looking at churches that are white. Um, or uh, in our own cities. I think this is one of the 
big challenges in this country. Um, any division, be it political, be it along race lines, um, um, can only be addressed if we know that God has created one creation and we are all made in his image and likeness. Thus we are equal, equally important, equally loved by God. And I'm thriving or striving to, to demonstrate, to, to, um, to meet people with this mindset, with this respectful um, attitude. Well, I appreciate that. And we're going to have to cut the questions off. There have been some terrific questions. I'm going to launch our poll, and I would really appreciate it if everyone could take a moment to fill out this poll. It's a few questions. It'll take you not more than a minute. Um, uh, your feedback is always vital and important to us. So please take a moment and, and fill out the poll that I've sent along. Um, as we move forward here, as um, Ursula is, um, we would love for you to be a career connection or to post a job, an internship or an externship with the Career Alliance. It's uh, a wonderful community that is devoted to building um, careers and pursuing interest and helping in the development and supporting these programs like we're doing with the net effect. So if you're not a career ally, then please go to abfcareeralliance.org and click the button that says Career Allies or Employers and post a connection or a job or an internship. If you're a student or a job seeker or furloughed or unemployed, reach out to people in our community. We have wonderful folks like Ursula who are willing to share their knowledge and help and, and mentor. So take a moment and really explore the Career Alliance um, if you'd like to connect with Madam Secretary General, we have a career connection and you can easily click on the link that I've posted and you can find that at the abfcareeralliance.org in any one of the sections, students, career allies, or job seekers. On the right hand side, you'll find our Twitter feed and you just click on that link right there and we will help facilitate that connection. So please take advantage of the wonderful people that we have and visit with them. Um, we recently learned how our students are being impacted by unprecedented world events and would like to say thank you for the work, for, for your contributions to our Brotherly Love campaign. Gratitude is what our students have said and have been expressing for their Brotherly Love scholarships. And we're pleased to share that because of your generosity, the immediate need was met. But now that summer's arrived and we're beginning school again, we're finding more students applying for, for financial need. And we expect there will be an additional $250 to $4,500 per student uh, of, of new expenses that will be incurred. So please, if you have a moment, take a look at our Brotherly Love campaign. We'd really appreciate your support. I know our students would. Um, when you have a minute, and you're in your social media, like us on Facebook at um, the Albert Baker Fund and on Twitter at Albert Baker, uh, ABF underscore connections at Instagram at Albert Baker Fund and LinkedIn ABF Career Alliance. I post connections and jobs there quite frequently and always wonderful stories that you can learn about. Ursula, thank you for this inspiring, wonderful, session we had today on the net effect. You're incredible. The work that you've done has been incredible. We are so blessed to have you as a part of our, our community and for, and for supporting this webinar series. It's been wonderful to be with you all. Well, I had we a terrific connected. time. Yeah, that's right. So today we learned about casting our net as the master has talked about and has given us that requirement. So just remember, if you have any questions or would like more information, email me, robin at albertbakerfund.org. 
But as much as I hate to, we're going to sign off. So thank you all for joining us today. It's been a wonderful, wonderful session. Um, thank you again, Ursula, for your, your kindness and your uh, willingness to share. And we are so looking forward to um, seeing you again soon.